Uh, Norm, you, as Jen mentioned, you know, you've been uh, mentoring a lot of people uh, since really since 1992, I guess. And uh, you, some of them are just starting their businesses. It's, it's grown more. Now it's probably a, a few dozen. It's 20, 20 people a year now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, some of these are people who are just starting their businesses, some of these people who actually have businesses. And what, what do you find with the, with the new people? What is the big thing that, is, is there a pattern there about what you, what, what you, uh, in terms of the mistakes that they tend to make and the, and the thing? Yeah, well, we've, we've written about it in a book and we've talked about this a lot, but a lot of people, see, when you're looking for a business, how many people are looking for a business? No, nobody? It's okay. When you're looking, you are. Okay, when you're looking for a business, it's hard to find one, right? You don't know what you're going to do, you have this, that, this, but when you're in business, 400 opportunities come at you at one time. Once you start, you're laughing, right? It's true. Once you start that business, oh, look at this over here. Look at this over here. You get these, all these great opportunities. And what, where most people fail in the beginning is they have limited amount of money, you know, and I'll talk about money in a few seconds, and they lose track of where they started, and they're running from here to here, and they can't succeed. So focus. I call it focus. Fo Focus with blinkers on, but you can wave a little bit. You have to stay focused in that business until that business becomes viable. And what I mean by viability is that business lives off its own cash flow. It doesn't have to be profitable, but it has to be off its own cash flow. Because money is an interesting commodity. It's the hardest commodity to get, and it's the easiest commodity to spend. And when you start out in businesses, unless you're like these lucky three guys over here, you know, <laughs> that somebody just gives you $100,000, We'll talk about that later. Um, what happens is that you have to, that probably is the only money you're going to get. And you have to make sure that money lasts until you get the viability, that you can live off your own cash flow. That's one of the most important things, and that's what people miss. They think, okay, I can borrow from my uh, uh, outlook financing, friends, relatives, uh, whatever, and, I, and then I can get more money. Chances are you're not going to get more money. So you have to make that last. And yeah. Just what we talked about early on when we discussed this discussion here. How, what's your advice on filtering advice? Filtering. Yeah, if you're getting a lot, you mean if you're getting a lot of advice and you're not sure which of it to yeah. take. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. There are people around that ask advice from 50 people and then they take the one they like. So uh, the, the the thing is that you got to take the one. When people come to me for advice, they give me advice. The last thing I say to them is the following thing. I'm only giving you this advice so you can think broaden your scope of thinking. What's ever in your gut and you feel is right to do, that's what you should do. The advice that you get it should be good for you. Anybody you go to is any good is giving you a different way of looking at things. And what happens is you can't go to 50 different people because you're going to get 50 different advices. But if somebody gives you advice, and you're thinking differently, you measure the two. And if that advice is good for you, or part of it's good for you, don't go to more than one or two people for advice. But You'll now, drive yourself crazy, and you know what? I find that most entrepreneurs, men and women, who start their businesses really have great gut feelings on what they're gonna do. And what they need is, the advice they need is what mistakes not to make. You're gonna make plenty of them, but you shouldn't make the same ones that everybody else makes. Like, for instance, you make a sale. What's a sale? You know when a sale's complete? When you get paid. That's when a sale's complete. So most salesmen go out there, do they ever ask, when am I gonna get paid? No, they're afraid. They're afraid the guy's gonna say, well, we pay in 120 days, they're gonna say, whoa, we can't take that sale. They only want the sale. I mean, that was me too, you know? Today, we talk about tough times and receivables, collecting receivables. The proper time to set up your collection of receivables is the, the sale, not when it's past due 120 days. You set it up when you make the sale. When are you paying? How does your company pay? Oh, you pay within 90 days? Well, we usually do 60 days, but we'll accept in 90 days as long as you pay within 90 days. You know, the time for the collection proceeding is at the beginning, not the end, when you're in the hole to do that. So that's one thing. Then you can accept the sale or not accept the sale. 
Now, so now we're yeah. on the subject. Of that would be 45,000 units. These three salespeople sell 300,000 units a year, year in, year out, for the last seven years. How, how do we do that? And I don't pay sales commission. Amazing. Isn't it amazing? Well, there's two parts to the thing. I don't believe in sales commission. Most people are afraid of their salespeople. They control the sale. First of all, I believe the company controls the sale. And I'll talk about that in a few seconds. But um, we integrate the sales process with the whole company. Our ops people help the sales people. Our customer service people help the sales people. The company controls the sale. And you know what? Good sales people want to earn a steady living, believe it or not. They don't like having one year earning 25,000 in commissions, the next year zero, or whatever the numbers may be. If you explain a program to them where they're getting their salary every year, their salary gets reviewed, plus we have a company-wide bonus pool. They get bonuses, as does the rest of the company, based on two things, how well the company does and how well they do. And so what happens? Salespeople cover for each other. There's no fighting over territories. It works. I've said this lots of times. I've had people switch to it. It takes some doing to do to switch over to it. But what it does is there's no fighting in my company. The company itself controls the sale, not the salesperson, because the salesperson isn't the only contact with that, with that, uh, with that client. Our ops people now have to contact them because they have to run the operations part. Our accounting people for the money part. Our uh, customer service people for the service part. So if and when that salesperson leaves and it doesn't like it there, um, that customer's ours. It's not leaving our facility. But you and didn't that's how we built, built it. And I have some rules for you, you didn't always. Uh, you, there was a time when There was a time when I paid sales commission. And I ended up, uh, two of those people are still with me. I bought them out of their sales commissions. Yeah. So. Um, now, does anybody want to argue with him about that? <laughs> I have the mic. That's very unfair. Now, Norm, Norm, you also have certain rules that you bring to bear in terms of hiring salespeople. Yeah, there's two types of salespeople in this world. Anybody know what they are? Everybody's afraid to guess, huh? Yes? <laughs> People that can't sell are not a salesperson, but it was a good try. People who want to stay with you and people who don't want to stay with you, right? People who are there for a moment or two or a year or two, and some of them go out and form their own companies. I, I encourage that. In fact, I usually send them a flower. It's a cactus, of course. But I, I see. <laughs> so I look for the people who want to stay with you. That's the first thing. Second thing is people have, have two jobs before they come to me as a salesperson. Why two jobs? The first job, green, they don't know what they want. They don't know the environment they want. No matter how good you treat them and how good they do, they're always going to want to leave because they want to see something else. They go to the second company, and now they understand what a culture of a company is. So when they come to you after two companies, not necessarily as salespeople, by the way, the third person, the first company you're going to, they're looking for a home to do within that home. So usually I have to have one job as a salesperson. The third requirement is never, 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 never hire from a competitor. Why? Why? Anybody know why? Why are you hiring from a competitor? Come on. You're a smart guy. Why would you hire? Why would I hire? No, not you. In general, why would anybody hire from a competitor? Marketing. Yeah, looking for shortcuts, marketing information, pipeline, customers. Guess what happens when they leave you? Hmm. Customers go, and they're smarter than you. Oh, I've been in this business for 15 years. This is how we did it at ABC. You guys don't know how to do anything. Why do you want somebody smarter than you working for you? You know, I, mean, I don't get it. And the third thing is never, 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 never hire a hot shot. What's a hot shot? Me, I'm a hot shot. Don't hire me. Don't hire. You don't need hot shots. You need the daily people who go out there and do their job right. Hot shots you can never get ahead of. They're always smart and you're four steps ahead of you. They're not going to last with the company. So those are the four rules that I have for hiring salespeople. <laughs>